Okay, so I believe machine learning can play a big role in advancing robotics. And what I mean with that is maybe even get robots out of their usual environments, which are manufacturing halls, where they can do the same task over and over to our homes and offices, hospitals, and so forth, where maybe we can get robots to do things that have a high variability and adapt to these variabilities. Today I'm going to tell you five stories about projects I've worked on where we've been able to leverage machine learning in a way that allowed us to do things in robotics that were not possible before. So listing of these five projects on the slide here, and we'll go through them in this order, and they'll also be decreasing in size. So the first story will take about half this presentation slot, next one will take about a quarter, then one eighth, and you see how we can keep going like that up to infinity. All right, so what are the challenges in controlling helicopters? When you control a helicopter, you're dealing with a very highly nonlinear system. The system has a lot of noise in it and coupled dynamics, meaning that if you excite one mode of the helicopter, it'll carry over to other modes of the helicopter. On top of that, because they vibrate a lot, it's hard to get good state information about the helicopter. It's hard to accurately know what the position, orientation, velocity, and angle rate of the helicopter are. This all combines to make it for a very difficult control problem. Now, despite these challenges, there's been quite a few successes in autonomous helicopter control. Here are a few examples on the slides, and kind of mainly the main message from this slide is that it's not one particular technique that has succeeded here. There's a lot of techniques that have fared well on getting a helicopter to hover. There is traditional PID control loop tuning, there is traditional PID loops, but learning the control gains, there is LQR, there's H infinity, there's many more. And all have gotten a helicopter to hover, despite it being such a challenging problem. Here's an example of how well this can work. It's hard to see it's even a movie. You hear the sound helping you probably, but this is very high performance hover control. And you can take this even further. So when seeing this, you might think, what's left? All right, this helicopter is already flying upside down. You might also wonder how that's even possible. I can tell you more about that later, but it is possible, you just saw it. Um, what's left? Well, what's left is that here, the helicopter was upside down, thanks to a human pilot bringing it upside down, and then the computer took over when it was already upside down. So just like the regular hover situation, what you were doing here with computer control was keeping it in a stationary state. There was no dynamic maneuvering involved. So once my former PhD advisor, Andrew, succeeded at doing this, I started working on the project and we said, let's try to flip the helicopter over. And given this seemed the most advanced way of flying helicopters, um, we said, let's use the exact same technique and now instead of asking for staying in place upside down, let's describe a trajectory where the helicopter flips over and use the same regulation but now around that trajectory and see what happens. So this is a great uh, November afternoon in late to November 2006 and it looks like we're succeeding. But it's moving a lot. It's not doing very clean flips in place. And it disappears in the trees. So what happened here? Um, what happened is the helicopter crashed, right? How did it crash? Well, it was trying to flip, but, but while doing so, it was exerting the control inputs too much, which made the engine, engine stall, and so the helicopter just kind of died, dropped out of the sky. Um, what you didn't see in the movie here was the most surprising thing, even though the engine died, it turns out helicopters can land with the engine dead. It's called auto rotation and our human safety pilot took back control despite the helicopter being be behind the trees, knew what the orientation of the helicopter was, got it horizontal and got it to flow down and land on its landing gear. No idea how he did it, but it still landed too hard and wasn't good, the helicopter was broken, but it was pretty amazing to see. 
So this was using kind of state-of-the-art methods from control, and we're gonna keep using those state-of-the-art methods from control. We're gonna augment them with learning that will allow us to succeed. So what have people succeeded at before we started doing this? There was just one group who was successful at doing aggressive maneuvers with a helicopter. It was Eric Frohn's group at MIT. Here's what they did. They did three maneuvers. Split S, which is a quick way of change direction without burning your potential energy into friction. A snap axle roll and a stall turn. The way they did this is by really carefully studying how humans do it. So they would have humans fly these three maneuvers. They would spend a lot of time figuring out how exactly the human pilots were doing this and then build controllers that mimic the behavior of the human pilot. So we said, why not go in and try to have machine learning do the same thing? Maybe if machine learning can analyze the human's behavior and learn to do these maneuvers, very similar to what they did by hand, we can maybe teach a helicopter a whole suite of maneuvers rather than being stuck with three because just doing one maneuver by hand takes a really long time. So why is this aggressive flight regime much harder than stationary flight regimes? In stationary flight regimes, essentially the solutions work as follows. You say, this is my flight regime. I'm gonna collect data in that regime. The way you do that is you put it in a regime, usually a human pilot, and then you kind of jerk around a tiny little bit with the joystick around that regime, collect data, maybe frequency sweeps, maybe step responses, and build a model. Often there's some free parameters that you fit with a linear regression or some other technique that's very similar. In these aggressive maneuvers, the additional challenges are, first, that the task is hard to describe. You can't just say, stay in place, that's your task. You have to describe a trajectory. You might say, oh, that's easy. I'm going to describe my trajectory as a stay in place and rotate, so you flip over. The problem with that is the helicopter can't do that. Now, the more subtle problem is that if you give the helicopter the task it can't do, it becomes really tricky to design controllers. Because if you want to design a controller for a helicopter, the state space is fairly large. So the best way to do this that people have to date is by designing controllers around the very specific trajectory. And to be able to do that, you need to know that trajectory. And then you can design a trajectory, the controller around that trajectory and successfully control around it. But if you give a bogus trajectory, you design a controller around the bogus trajectory, you get exactly what you saw in the video where the helicopter went down in the trees. Second task then is to find a good dynamics model. A lot of the best control techniques rely on having a good model for how the helicopter would behave so you can reason about what would happen if I were to apply these control inputs. And then you can plan based on that and keep replanning as you're flying to compensate for perturbations. So let's look at learning the target trajectory first. It's difficult to specify by hand because helicopter dynamics is complicated. We tried, we tried very hard and we didn't succeed. We probably spent about a year, a year and a half, resulting in the video you saw with the helicopter going into the trees. And we read a lot of books Tried a lot of things. At that point we said, despite doing a lot of reading, this is too hard for us, maybe we can just have a machine learn it. Our solution was to collect demonstrations of desired maneuvers, and then somehow extract a clean trajectory from that. The challenge here is that the pilot, even if he's an expert pilot, will not do the same thing over and over when you ask him to do demonstrations. So you can think of it as a denoising problem. You get a bunch of demonstrations, and somehow you want to get a clean version out, and then that's going to be your target trajectory. Let me show you the type of demonstrations we're getting from our pilot. What you see here is six demonstrations of the same air show. It's a sequence of aggressive aerobatic maneuvers. We have a set of sensors on the helicopter, on the ground, to track position and orientation reasonably accurately. And then what you see here is a graphical replay of what was actually flown up to some reasonable accuracy. If you look at this, these demonstrations are very similar. These helicopters are going through the same sequence of maneuvers, but they're not doing it at the same time, not at the same place, not with exactly the same orientation. And so we want to clean this up and get out one trajectory that is the best of all of these. Kind of better than the best of all of these. So, if you're working machine learning, a natural thing to do is to think of this as, well, looks like an HMM, right? You have a sequence of states that you try to recover and you get observations over time. So that's what we started out with. Sequence of states, we don't know what they are, but we're going to recover them. There's a dynamics model. 
for the helicopter can be plugged into the transition model. The demonstrations are observations, so we get to see sequence of helicopter states. Now, because the timing isn't exactly the same in all of these, we don't know how to hook them up to these hidden states, but if we knew how to hook them up, we'd have a HMM. So, how do we align these? We follow an iterative procedure. So the first thing is to say, well, let's just randomly initialize this initial trajectory, let's say with one of the demonstrations, or some version of a mix of them, that we come up with by hand. Usually we take the one that has the average duration of all demonstrations. So if we have five, take the one with the middle, the median duration, put it in the hidden trajectory. Once we have that in there, we can do pairwise alignment. So alignment is expensive for multiple sequences, but if you just have two, it's fairly efficient to do. So we align demo one with the hidden trajectory that we now have an estimate for. We align demo two. Now we have a standard HMM state sequence that we're going to recover and a set of observations, two at each time. We run HMM forward backward here. This is a continuous state space, so it'll be an extended Kalman filter. We run forward backward, but it's the same idea. Standard probabilistic inference. Run it forward backward, get a set of state estimates out, and this is our first estimate of what the hidden trajectory could be. Once we have this estimate, we iterate. So now we have a better estimate. We disconnect these observations. We again run dynamic time warping, which is a standard algorithm from the speech literature, and the same algorithm is known as needleman winch in the biological sequence alignment literature. So we run that to realign, then rerun the forward backward, get a new trajectory out, keep repeating this until this converges. Usually this takes about five iterations. Here's what the result looks like after you do this on these six demonstrations we just looked at. So we have a new helicopter in the picture here, the white one. That's the one that is the recovered trajectory that we think of as the intent of the pilot, what he was trying to fly when flying these noisy trajectories. If you look careful at this white trajectory, you'll see that this is a cleaner version of the other ones. And what you also see here is that all of them are time aligned, so when we're replaying things here, it's the time aligned version of each of the trajectories. Look at this a little more quantitatively. Here is a particular cut of the demonstrations. This is the double loop sequence. We have three demonstrations shown here, and this is what you get out after running this process, the black dotted trajectory. So you get is much cleaner circles than any of the demonstrations. The kink in the purple one was likely due to imperfect sensory measurements. It's unlikely that the helicopter actually flew that kink, but all those things get accounted for as noise and get smoothed out in this denoising step. So the black one is now our target trajectory for the double loop. The next step to be able to do control is to find a dynamics model. If you look at standard helicopter dynamics models, they might look something like this. These are rigid body models for the helicopter, so capturing everything about the aerodynamics into forces that result on the helicopter. You might not be familiar with the notation, but the thing to look at here is the capital C's. The capital C's are the free parameters in this model. Everything else you're going to get from data collection. If you look at the capital C's, they're vectors, they appear linearly in these equations, so you can run a linear regression to find those from data. And that, if you did that, you collect the data, here u dot is the derivative of the forward velocity, v dot is the derivative of the sideways velocity, w dot derivative of the vertical velocity, p, q, and r are angular rates, the dotted version are the derivatives. If you collect that data, run a linear regression, and then design a controller based on this simulation model, you can hover a helicopter. Um, but if you try to do the same thing for these dynamic maneuvers, it doesn't work. Now let's look a little more carefully about how accurate the model you get for these dynamic maneuvers. Here the horizontal axis is time. Vertical axis is the error the model makes in predicting the acceleration of the helicopter. So you have your data. Based on data at the current time, you predict the acceleration the helicopter will experience. Then you do look at the data of the at the next time, see what the actual acceleration was, you make the difference. This is in meters per second squared, so gravity is about 10 meters per second squared. What you see here is that you get up to 
three Gs of error in predicting the acceleration of the helicopter. That's huge, right? That's being off by three times gravity in anticipating what's going to happen makes it really hard to control a helicopter. In fact, makes it impossible if you do it based on a model that's like that. Now if we look more carefully at all these demonstration trajectories, here's what they look like originally. Same thing, acceleration error as a function of time. And here's what they look like after running the algorithm that extracts the intent of the pilot, which does time alignment. So what we see here is this 3G error. Yes, it's an error in the model, but it's very consistent. It's not noise, it's not stochasticity in the dynamics of the helicopter. It's something that if you do the same maneuver over and over, you're going to over and over get these additional 3Gs pushing on the helicopter, and you can anticipate this. So we should. So the key observation here is that while helicopter dynamics is really complicated, it turns out that while not deterministic, it is fairly repeatable. And that's probably why, pilot, why pilots can learn to fly a helicopter so well. After a lot of training, they've recovered the patterns of the helicopter dynamics. They know how it works. It's not going to be a big surprise to them. It's just very complicated, but after a while, their muscle memory has built up the recognition of what will happen and being able to anticipate it. So what we want to do is somehow capture this variability. And what it models is things like airflow around the helicopter, that's part of the true state, but it's not in our state space model, actuated delays, and flapping of the blades. So what we do is we say, given the repeatability, we're going to still stay away from modeling airflow because it's very expensive to simulate the airflow. And we're going to learn models that are specific to the trajectory we're trying to execute. And the idea here is rather than running a standard linear regression to find these C vectors, do a weighted linear regression. So you get the data from a particular slice of your trajectory and weight the data closest to your current time most highly and data further away from your current time less. What will happen is that you learn a model that is fine-tuned to where you're currently at in this trajectory and if you look at that model, it'll capture that entire pattern that we saw that wasn't captured by this global model that was trying to learn one set of coefficients. You will learn a model that's very specific to the trajectory you're trying to fly and that's part of the side effect of doing it this way. You don't learn to fly just arbitrary things. You learn to fly the maneuvers your pilot has been demonstrating to you. Let's take a look at how well this works. The experimental setup we had is one where we had cameras on the ground looking up at the helicopter. That allows us to track position. Our pilot can track orientation and position with his eyes. Um, the cameras we had, visual processing we had, and also just with technology that's available, it makes more sense to put accelerometers, gyros, and magnetometer on the helicopter, because that helps you getting orientation out much more easily. So we had that on the helicopter, also sonar to measure distance from the ground. Helicopter sent us data at 333 hertz. That got combined in an extended Kalman filter with the position data coming from the stereo cameras on the ground. Now don't think of stereo cameras as a pair of eyes looking there like this. These cameras are standing 30 meters apart giving us much better conditioning on this stereo problem. Um, the accuracy we got was 10 centimeter accuracy throughout the entire space that we were flying in. Then the computer gives that state information to a control algorithm. That control algorithm will compute the control inputs and send those out at 20 hertz. So here's the complete procedure. We collect some baseline data for a baseline model similar to what we did for hover. This is just frequency sweeps. What this will do effectively is, if you're in a particular part of this trajectory, you get the locally weighted data there. That data will not excite all the modes of the helicopter. And to still have some information about the other modes that you haven't seen anything about in that particular part of the trajectory, this other data will come in. It will be weighted less, but it'll contribute because there's nothing in that part of the space from your local data. Then, our expert pilot demonstrates the air show several times say so usually 10 times, and we take five that we think were the best demonstrations. We use those five to learn a target directory, to learn a dynamics model, and in fact this happens interleaved. Just like in an HMM where you can do forward, backward, re-estimate the parameters of the model, the same thing's happening here. So we interleave estimation of dynamics model and learning of the trajectory in one process. 
We find the optimal control policy to fly the helicopter. What that means is we use, in this particular case, we used something called iterative LQR. What that does is it says, I have a model, I have an objective criterion, which is it, something that penalizes deviation from the target trajectory quadratically in our case, and it finds a sequence of controls that will achieve optimally on this criterion based on our simulation model. Then we go up to fly autonomously. Now you can't just execute that sequence of controls because helicopters are uns have unstable dynamics. If you just execute a sequence of controls for maneuvers like this, after about two seconds you're dug into the ground. So what happens is you compute the sequence of controls, you execute the very first set of controls for the first one twentieth of a second, you get back the state after one twentieth of a second, and now you resolve your original optimization problem, but now it's one twentieth of a second shorter. You go from one twentieth of a second into the problem till the end and solve for the sequence of controls that's optimal from this starting configuration. So you're resolving this optimization problem in this while you're flying at 20 hertz. This is really hard to do. It's a big optimization problem. So that's not completely feasible. So what happens is instead of solving until the end of your trajectory, we solve until two seconds into the future. So this is a shorter replanning problem. Um, the problem then is that after two seconds, you're, if you just ignore what comes after, you would do very poorly. You need to anticipate what's coming. So the offline computation gives us something a little extra. It also gives us a function that tells us at each time how bad it is to end up somewhere at that time. And so after the two second horizon for which we solve, that function gets applied as an additional cost in the optimization. And it's actually the highest cost. It's especially optimizing for where you'll be two seconds into the future. You fly the air show. Now, if you did this just straight up, actually wouldn't work yet. Um, you would be able to fly about five seconds into this air show, and then this helicopter would start deviating and not be able to recover. Um, so what we do is, we're five seconds in, our human pilot takes over, we bring it back to the starting configuration, our algorithm looks at the data that was collected during this autonomous flight, uses that five seconds of data to improve the dynamics model. It learns a new locally weighted model around that trajectory that was just executed. Thanks to doing that, on the next trial, it'll be able to fly for seven seconds or eight seconds. And so it keeps re-optimizing the controller, relearning the dynamics model through usually 10, 20 iterations to get to a point where it has fully learned to fly the entire trajectory. This is something called iterative learning control. It's where you know that you're gonna do the same task and so you use that knowledge to fine tune your controller through real world trials. So you go back to step four. After going around this loop about 10, 20 times, you're busy for about an hour and here's the type of result you get. What you see here is completely autonomous. We're starting on the ground, helicopter flips over. Then the choice of this particular air show was such that it would demonstrate all past capabilities in the first five seconds and everything after that is what people couldn't do before. So hover was done before, split S was done before, it's a half roll followed by a half loop, snap roll was done before, and stall turn was done before. From now on these are maneuvers nobody was able to do. So you get loops, Once you're good at loops, you do pirouettes at the top. Stall turn, that's a way of changing direction where you climb rather than burning your kinetic energy into friction. Hurricane is a fast backward flying circles. These helicopters are about, their blades are 800 millimeters long, so almost a meter for a single blade, but this helicopter goes at up to 50 miles per hour. So this thing is flying pretty fast, especially when it's coming down. And these are some of the hardest maneuvers. Why are these the hardest maneuvers? When you stay in place, the helicopter is working in air, it's just been pushing around. So it's much harder to predict what the influence of the airflow is on the helicopter.
Other maneuvers we've done that you haven't seen in this particular video are auto rotation landings, which I mentioned earlier. It's where you, let's say your engine dies and you still want to come down safely. What you do is your helicopter blades will essentially act, it's not exactly like a wind turbine, but you can think of it that way and absorb your altitude energy into blade spinning energy, which then will be burned off into friction. And so you can still land relatively safely. Um, usually in a real helicopter, your helicopter will be broken, but the people in the helicopter will survive if it's well done. Um, another thing is something called chaos. It's where you essentially flip around in place while spinning the tail around. Um, so those are some of the other maneuvers that we've done that weren't of this part of this particular air show, but it kind of completes the entire repertoire our pilot had. Um, so one question you might ask yourself is, okay, you did all the maneuvers that expert pilots can do, but maybe you were doing them very inaccurately. You were just kind of doing them. They looked good, but they weren't well done. Let's take a look at how well done they were. So remember, white is what we're trying to fly, and black is how close we were. So black is showing where the helicopter actually was. Now, this is a graphics replay, but this is replaying recordings of position and orientation of the helicopter, right? This is actual flight that we're replaying here, and it's showing that we're within a meter of where we were asked to be. This is very high accuracy, even for people who spend their lives on fine-tuning helicopter hover controllers. If they get one meter accuracy, they tend to be pretty happy. Okay, so we fly exactly where we want to fly. So we've seen how to teach a helicopter to fly by having an expert pilot with a machine learning algorithm. Essentially at the core there's probabilistic inference and then we combine that with optimal control to get the helicopter to fly these maneuvers. One thing I want to point out is we didn't change anything on the control side. We just read a lot of control papers tried a lot of things and converged on optimal control as the existing technique that would work best for our problem. The novelty was all in the learning the trajectory and learning the specific dynamics models for these trajectories to make this work and in exactly how we did the iterative learning control, which is a little different from what other people have done before. So you say, well, isn't exactly brain surgery yet, yet. so how about something like this? Well, we're not going to brain, do brain surgery just yet, but let's take a small step in that direction. So if we look at surgery, one of the frequently reoccurring tasks with systems like this Da Vinci system here, so what you're looking at is a system that's used in about 3,000 hospitals around the world. The hospitals tend to use it once or twice a day. What you do with this system is you have a surgeon sitting off to the side there on the left, they move what you can think of as joysticks, but not really joysticks. They move two things around, two haptic devices around. They have six degrees of freedom, those haptic devices. Whatever motions they make get mimicked on robot end effectors that are inside the patient. These robot end effectors are really small. So what you can do is you get very intuitive control, moving your hands around outside the patient and very small motions inside the patient. And you can make tiny incisions that allow you to do complicated surgeries and surgeons have, a lot of surgeons like to use this system, this is a commercial system, and say that it's extremely intuitive to do surgeries this way. Now, one of the frequently reoccurring tasks for them is knot tying. So when I gave this presentation at the University of Washington about autonomous helicopter flight, one of the researchers there working on surgical robotics said, well, you have your pilot, it's the surgeon, you can record everything they do. Um, is this gonna work too? to just learn how to do surgeries here. We said let's give it a try and start with the kind of most frequently reoccurring task, which is tying knots. And here's what we were able to learn. So these robots are not the ones you'd clinically see used. These are ones we built ourselves at Berkeley. Um, same kind of mechanism. What you see here is two what would be through holes that don't move. Those are the incisions, where the incisions would be for the patient. You go through, pick up the suture. The way to tie knots is by wrapping it around the other instrument, picking up the other end, and then pulling through. Now, unlike the helicopter case where, unlike the helicopter case where you got really used to success and you know, things just worked every time. 
There's no time, it wasn't working every time. You can hear that from the excitement of the students, how surprised and excited they were this experiment succeeded, right? We had success about 50% of the time. No patience yet, right? Okay, so why is that? In, in some sense, the helicopter task is a lot harder. Wind perturbations are a lot more difficult to deal with. The dynamics is unstable. The rate at which you need to do control is much higher than for this knot tying task. But what's different is kind of what I alluded to at the very beginning of this presentation is that what makes it really hard for robots to do things is not necessarily the same as what makes it hard for humans. Robots can compute fast and can reject perturbations in reasonable ways, but variability is really hard for them to deal with. And so the hard thing here was that if you look at this particular problem, you're presented with a rope or a suture in front of you, and now you're presented with a new suture. It's not in exactly the same configuration. And in this kind of task, you can't just say, I'm going to reject that perturbation and then execute my task. There's a lot of things that are hard to deal with here. And so what you need to do is somehow understand that if I'm faced with this new situation, I have to do something a little different. I can't do the same thing as before. So let me look at a cartoon problem setting. Let's say you're given four points, and that describes your situation. So much less than an entire rope, just four points. And now, this is your trajectory that somebody demonstrates for you. You say, for these four points, if that's the location, that's what you should do. Okay, now, computer is, robot is presented with new configuration of the four points. And the question is, well, what is the trajectory going to be now? Ideally, somehow, there'd be a mechanism to understand that these points have shifted around and that accordingly the trajectory should shift in some way that's meaningful. So let's start with the first part. Let's say you have the points connect. You have a way of registering them. Okay, then what we're going to do here is to think of these four points as a set of samples of a function that you're going to learn. So we say we're learning a function in this case from R2 to R2. We have four samples. I'm going to try to recover the function for the entire space. A lot like linear regression will give you a couple of samples. You cover a function for the entire line. Same thing here. Okay, so how to do this? Well, ideally, we get something out that maybe looks like this. That would be the entire function representation. I haven't told you how to get this, but maybe that's what it would look like. And once you have that, the way to complete this learning procedure to get the robot to do something would be to say, well, if I know the entire mapping, I can map the trajectory. And in this case, the trajectory would look like this. And then, you could imagine that if the way you learn that function is in some sense right, then this function that you learn will lead to a trajectory that does reasonably well. So the big question is, how do we go from the four points to the entire function? And this is something we just started working on recently. We worked on this for about four months now. We have one particular way of doing this. Um, for the helicopter, I'm pretty convinced it's really hard to improve on what we did. For this one, I think there's a lot of improvements possible still, but we already have some pretty reasonable success stories. So here's what we started out with. We said, let's find a function. It'll be from R3 to R3, because in general that's the space we work in. And that function should minimize the Frobenius norm, which is just some choice of norm, but it has some justification to pick that one, of the second derivatives matrix. Subject to the constraint that the points for which we have a registration from training situation to test situation are mapped correctly. Okay, what's nice about this is that, well, first thing is picking that Frobenius norm of the second derivatives matrix gives you something where translation, rotation, and scaling are free. So if you could just translate, rotate the situation to the new situation, well, then you're all set. You'll end up with just a translated, rotated version of the original trajectory. So that's nice, because you imagine that that's, that's all that's needed to be done, that might be the best choice. Scaling is free too, so you can see there are still some deficiencies here. You might prefer translation and rotation over scaling. You might actually prefer rotation around the vertical axis 
over rotation around the horizontal axis, just because gravity, the way gravity interacts with you, if you rotate around the vertical axis, it doesn't change gravity. If you rotate around the horizontal axis, it does. So there's a lot of room for improvement still, but this is just our starting point for now. A nice thing about this is that this can be solved efficiently, this optimization problem. You don't have to solve some big partial differential equation to get the function out. You can solve just a set of um, essentially quadratic programming problems to get the solution to this. And you get some kernel-based solution. This is what it looks like. So solving this problem leads to a function that's a weighted combination of kernels plus an affine part. Affine is free, so it doesn't show up in the kernels. And then the kernels will look as shown over there. This is something that has been around for a long time. It's called thin plate splines. We haven't invented this. We haven't figured out that these are the kernels and so forth. This was done by way back quite a while ago. But we saw that this seemed to be the right way to go out about this problem. And what we're doing now, future work, is extending this to changes this objective to not just account for Frobenius norm of second derivatives, but account for more physics considerations. So here's what we've been able to do with this. Here's a student demonstrating how the robot can pick up a plate, block it on one side, coming with the gripper on the other side. Now you look at this and you say, well, that's fairly straightforward. I could have programmed that. And I bet you, you could have programmed that. I also bet you it would take you in a, a day or two days to program it. The reason being that program a robot to come in with the right orientation, get everything right, tends to be a very iterative process. It takes a lot of time to get things right. And the idea here is not that we can do things that we couldn't do before. The idea here is that you can teach things in a couple minutes rather than needing to program for a whole day. So left side is a demonstration. Middle shows the transformation. The yellow grid that you see is a grid that started as a nice rectangular grid. And you see how it gets warped. So you see the function f visualized. And then on the right side, you see how the plate is being picked up. Here, scooping out of a cup. So you go in, try to scoop. Left side is demonstration. Right side is learn. And then here is back to the knot tie. Here is a student demonstrating the knot tie. And here is what the robot is doing for a new configuration. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is at the end of this task, a particular one like this, you're not going to want to just look at the initial situation, map from old to new, learn the function, find a directory, and execute. You're going to want to repeat that process. So three or four times throughout this process, the robot takes a new snapshot. There's a new mapping to the closest situation in the demonstration and then remaps trajectory and executes the next, let's say, 10 seconds of the trajectory. Here it goes. And now this technique works close to 100% of the time. As I mentioned, for this we still have a long way to go and maybe I imagine other people will contribute ideas to this and have different objective functions that might work better than the one we've ha we have so far. But I think it's the right direction to have robots come from these manufacturing environments to our home environments and have them learn to adapt to this particular geometry that they encounter there. Now, as I said, the stories get shorter and shorter and shorter. There's three brief stories I want to touch upon here. Let's start with the first one. Here's something we did a little while ago and we said, let's look at how optimal control tends to work. You try to find a control policy. The way you do is you specify a dynamics model, you specify a cost function or a reward function. You solve an optimal control problem, out comes your controller. That's nice. It's often a lot easier to do that, that is specifying your reward function and dynamics model than specifying your control policy. Still specifying both of those can be difficult. For the reward function, um, if you look at the number of parameters your reward function has, it's often a lot less than the control policy, so that's nice. And so one thing we've been looking at is, in practice it can be hard to even specify the reward function, so why not learn it, right? Let's say you know your reward function cares about being in the right lane for a car and having a safe driving distance, but you don't know how much to weight each one of them. The practical process is one of, I'll weight them some way, I'll find an optimal control policy, see what happened, I'll say, oh, it's not caring enough about the safe following distance, let's weight that up. You go back in and keep repeating this, right? So the question we looked at is, can you take a demonstration and recover the weighting between all the features that contribute to your reward function? This line of work has a long history. It started with Kalman back in 64, 
who invented optimal control in a way, and then he said, well, if somebody now gives me a control policy, can I decide whether they gave me something that's optimal with respect to some problem setting or not? And then Stephen Boyd generalized that from 1D to higher dimensions with linear matrix inequalities. Then further down the road, Andre and Stuart Russell kind of looked at it in the reinforcement learning setting. Then we started our work to tie it. The Stuart Russell and Andre work was mostly pointing out that there's a lot of ambiguity. There's not a unique reward function associated with somebody's demonstration. We started looking at ways of doing the, putting in a prior that tells you how to disambiguate. And then there was a whole line of work of different ways of putting in priors to disambiguate your reward function and make a choice among the ones that are all consistent with the demonstration. And here are some pictures of some of the applications. What I'm going to show is the, this one here. This is a four-legged robot. The problem here is to get it to walk across rocky terrains. It has to do some kind of climbing across. <coughs> Moving the robot legs into a particular configuration was a solved problem when we worked on this. You move the motors and we have a good model for where that will move the feet. The hard part was to choose where to place the feet so that the robot would get across rather than tipping over or sliding out of the terrain. Um, You'd say, why is that hard? Why are we talking about reward functions? Slipping and sliding, tumbling, that sounds like dynamics. Well, that's just part of the practicality of working in robotics. You have a dynamics model, you have a reward function. Your dynamics model often isn't good enough. And you might never get it good enough. And what you end up doing is saying, I'm gonna put some of my knowledge about the problem, such as I don't like slipping and sliding. I can't simulate it reliably quickly enough. I'm going to put it in the cost function. I'm going to say, don't get into situations where you would slip and slide. And that way you avoid the parts of the dynamics that you couldn't simulate well, thanks to tuning your reward function. But we don't want to tune it. We want to learn it. So we don't have to go through that process of tuning it till things work. So here there were 25 features. An example feature is, what is the distance of the center of gravity from the boundary of the support triangle of the three feet currently on the ground? Ideally it's inside that support triangle. That's when you're stable. Um, but how much margin you have will affect how stable you are. What is the slope underneath each of the feet? What is the height differential between the different feet? And so forth. We had 25 total. We said, okay, let's demonstrate a robot across a rocky terrain. Let's now run our apprenticeship learning approach, which learns how to weight these 25 different features. The way it learns it, the process underneath is something where find the weighting such that if you use that weighting and if you solve the optimal control problem, you will find the demonstration trajectory. Then when we get a new train, and we get a height map for the train in these test situations, we compute the cost function for all poses of the robot on the new terrain, and then compute the optimal way of getting across that new terrain. So here's an example result. Um, the terrain we're looking at is one that didn't even exist when we did the learning. We built our own terrains, did learning, and then DARPA, which is a military funding agency in the US, um, would have these challenges where they have a new board that you haven't seen before, and now the robot needs to get across that new board it hasn't seen before. Um, so we have true generalization here to the extent that we didn't even know about the existence of test data at the time we were doing the learning. Now this is without learning. If you use the standard low-level controller that we had, to place the feet equally spaced across this terrain. It's getting stuck. The Louisville controller is pretty good at trying to get loose. <laughs> but not working out yet. Now here's what happens if the foot placement is planned with the learned reward function or cost function. And so we have now an optimal sequence of footsteps across relative to that cost function. You see it's unavoidable for feet to slip and slide, but whenever they slip and slide, it's in a way that doesn't make the robot tumble or get stuck. And so it gets across quite quickly. This is a state of the art when we did this. In fact, very interestingly, the other team in that project that had the same performance at the time was a team from CMU, and they did it based on a variant of this inverse optimal control that I just presented. Um, this was a 2006 paper you saw on the list of later work on inverse optimal control. Okay, so we've seen the robots learn from people, from demonstrations. How about exploring on their own? Let's say you're a Mars rover. 
and you're exploring Mars, and you use some standard reinforcement learning algorithm, let's say E cubed, which is a standard explore exploit kind of algorithm, or R max, this is the kind of behavior you'd get. And the assumption here is that we make here is that the rover can go up a slope up to a certain angle. If it's too steep, it can't go up the slope. So what happened here is it went down into a crater after a while, so it starts on the right, the green spots are very well explored, goes down into the crater, and then it can never get back out. All it explored is the crater. What you really prefer your robot to do is some kind of safe exploration, where it realizes that going to the crater is probably a bad thing to do, you don't want to get stuck there, and so what it does is it explores around the crater only parts of the space where it knows it can keep going. What we really like to get to this is an actual experimental result of our approach. What they really like to get to, and this is still some human in the loop, is something like this. Where rather than teaching a helicopter to fly by collecting data from a human, you just have it explore around the part that it, of the state space that it's already aware of how it works. In this case, sitting on the ground is pretty safe. Taking off a little bit, you can just shut down the motor and land fairly safely. And then the more you learn, the more you dare to go up, And here's the final controller we got. Now what you see here is not fully autonomously learned. The helicopter is flying autonomously, but the human is still in the loop to shut down whenever the human thinks you're leaving your safety boundary. But aside from the human shutting down when you're about to leave the safety boundary, this is all done autonomously. This helicopter learned to fly with the human not knowing how to control a helicopter except for shutting it down when it thinks it's getting in the unsafe regime. The idea we looked at is the following. Um, Looks a little mathematical, it is. Um, but the main idea here is that we try to find a policy that optimizes some exploration bonus, which is standard in reinforcement learning. Things you don't know about, you give a bonus. If you visit those states, you get high reward because you learn something new. Problem with that is that you get drawn to states that are very unsafe very often. So there's a constraint, rather than just optimizing rewards, there's a constraint, subject to the constraint that if at any given time, Somebody says, now it's time to get back to where you started from. Then you should be able to get back with a probability that's high enough. Turns out the last constraint is MP hard, so couldn't really enforce that constraint, but what we did is we over constrained it. We made it more safe than what is expressed right there. If you do that, it becomes a tractable problem. And what we're essentially solving is a constrained optimization problem in the MDP world, market decision process world, where you optimize your world subject to some safety constraint. And the result is the Mars exploration behavior that you saw. Last thing I want to show to you is some results we got in perception, thanks to machine learning. And what we're able to do here is to reliably detect corners of towels. Now, once you can reliably detect corners of towels, this is the kind of stuff you can get. Robot is inspecting this towel. And you might wonder why towels, why do we care about towels? And this again goes back to the very beginning of the presentation. What we're interested in is getting robots to do things that require the robots to deal with very high variability. And so if your object deforms and appears in different shapes anytime you encounter it, then even the same object will have a lot of variability. So that's why we went with this. Uh, maybe also because I don't like folding my own towels. It's all completely autonomous. Um, this was done 50 times, 50 times successfully for all five towels. No, let me rephrase that. 50 times successfully for a single towel. So we did it 50 towels in a row. Um, this was sped up 200 times. So this one experiment, one towel takes about 20 minutes in what you see here. <laughs> if you don't speed up the video. We could spend the entire conference watching this robot doing its 50 experiments, right? It works really well. We've seen sped it up. This is the original result. Now it takes about two minutes to do one towel. Okay, in conclusion, what I've presented to you is a suite of algorithms that I like to think of as apprenticeship learning, where a robot is taking the apprentice role relative to an expert who's teaching the robot. Um, robots learn how to do dynamic helicopter maneuvers. 
we've presented things where a helicopter can, um, a robot can learn how to adapt a demonstration to a new situation, like in the rope manipulation. We've looked at safe exploration where a robot doesn't just go to places it doesn't know about, but it goes to places where it knows it can recover from, but that it doesn't know about yet. We've looked at how to get inverse optimal control working, and that helped us with the quadruped across the rocky terrains. And at the end, we looked at some perception applications of machine learning and robotic control. That's it for my presentation. Thank you. Do you think that in the future it will be possible for robots to learn from other robots other than humans? Absolutely. So, if you look at some of the projects that are currently going on, there are, I think it's an EU project um, where the idea is that robots will be networked and if one robot learns something, of course if the robots are all the same it's fairly trivial, but the idea would be that a robot of one type of form factor would learn something and other robots could take that data and learn from that to do something. I absolutely think that's, that would be the case. Um, it's not possible yet, but robots have a lot of bandwidth in terms of learning once they can do that. Things can go very fast. The tricks you were doing that helicopter were amazing. I'm guessing that the average helicopter, military helicopter, doesn't have so much power to weight ratio that it can do all that fancy stuff. Is it a much harder problem when you have a normal helicopter? Okay, so the real question where it kind of come down, comes down to is, what are the difference in challenges between a bigger size helicopter versus a smaller helicopter, right? The big helicopters are not designed to fly these types of maneuvers. They're optimized for aerodynamic performance and flight efficiency in the flight regimes they're mostly in, which is forward flight. So a big difference is their wings or their blades are, are designed as wings a little bit, whereas the blades of these helicopters are designed symmetrically. So when you're upside down, the blades essentially look the same. So flying upside down is harder because you balance the mass on top, but it's not, the blades don't really experience anything different per se. Um, what we experienced when we flew, we've flown some bigger helicopters than the one you saw here. And what we experienced there is that part of the challenge with the bigger helicopters is that they have bigger structures that can oscillate. So if you do high frequency control, you have to be more careful because what you'll get is one, the blades will start oscillating, flapping up and down. And that's a mode you really don't want to get into because your helicopter can start putting all its energy in that shaking uh, motion of body relative to blades. So that's one thing to look at there. Um, what happened when we did this, we put up a big, we had a big helicopter, somebody wanted us to fly, we went up. First thing that happened is exactly that happened. Actually not just the blades like this, but it's the entire rotor disc that would wobble relative to the helicopter. Essentially what the solution was, was to, in the cost function, penalize for frequencies that are too high and keep those out. Once we did that, it could reliably hover such a big helicopter too. We haven't done the full, full scale ones, so I can't, talk from experience in how it would work out there. But that one was blades of about a meter and a half or two meters, relative to these ones were a meter size blades. Yeah. Um, concerning the, the, the experiment about the helicopter, I'm wondering if the, the optimal um, uh, strategy is, is the best to use in practice because, uh, for example, if I am a shooter and I want to shoot your, your helicopter, uh, if it's too predictable, it will be uh, uh, easier for me to shoot you. And, and maybe the, um, the experts that made so many loops, it was not about the, the, an error for, it, for him, but just mm -hmm. about uh, an adaptability to, to, to an attack. So uh, how could you uh, uh, add a, a, like a random parameter in your function or something like that? Um, one thing I'm going to show to you is that just the highest variability maneuver that we've flown is called a chaos. So what happens here is the helicopter flips and at the same time rotates the blades around, uh, rotates the tail around. So if you want high variability, you could actually decide that that's what you want. You could go with it. But I think it's a, it's a great point. You need to design your criterion based on what's important for you. So if your criterion were, I don't want to get shot, then that needs to go into your design of your control policy. You can't just assume that flying pretty is going to get that done for you. And that partially goes back to the later part where you say you need to learn 
your objectives sometimes, or you need to tweak it, whatever you prefer. For us, learning has worked better than, t or we prefer it over spending long times tweaking the objective. But that's really important, and that often leads to the wrong behavior if you don't get it right. Thank you for that talk. That was very inspiring, very nice. Um, you have argued very well about the fact that it's very complicated and very interesting to, to learn from people. But of course, nowadays you have these very nice uh, uh, physics engines, uh, simulators in games consoles, and uh, obviously you have a much wider potential for learning from there. Can you elaborate about learning from simulators? And did you actually uh, learn from simulators in one of these uh, experiments? Okay. That's a really good question. How can we leverage these good game engines and simulators to get things to work in the real world? We've tried whenever we could, whenever they're realistic enough and at the same time fast enough, it's really good to get to use them. So for the robotic manipulation task we're looking at, where you see the robot picking a plate and tying a knot in a rope, we are using them. So in those, we use something called Bullet, which is an open source simulation engine, which is fairly convenient to interface with. And that has worked really well. For helicopters, there are some good simulators, but the ones that are good, we haven't been able to interface with. And ones that are really good tend to be slow because they tend to simulate aerodynamics. And so it's, it's not ideal if the simulator is very slow, it's tough to learn something from it because you need to wait very long before you get a result. But for the rigid body or even rope simulation, the simulators are plenty fast. And they played a big role in getting this done. Thank you.